Hong Kong's innovation chief says a plan for a cross-border data transfer deal with the mainland will be available in a few months. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen wraps up her four-day visit to China. And Ukraine's president brings former commanders of Azovstal defenders back home from Turkey. Hello and welcome to TVB News. Secretary for Innovation, Technology and Industry Sun Dong noted that a plan for a cross-border data transfer deal with the mainland will be developed in a few months. The innovation chief stressed that the move could transform Hong Kong into an international data hub. He reassured members of the public that their personal data will be protected under strict laws. Timothy Lee has our top story. Striving to make its name known in the world of global innovation, Chief Executive John Lee earlier noted that Hong Kong is aiming to develop a cross-border data transfer pilot program. This, as Secretary for Innovation, Technology and Industry Sun Dong pointed out that due to rising global tension, Beijing began restricting its data outflow last year. But he added that Hong Kong has already signed a memorandum with the nation's cyberspace administration on the implementation of the data transfer plan. The innovation chief further referred to data as a major asset of the future, noting that the deal could transform the city into a global data hub and in turn attract large numbers of mainland and overseas enterprises. That's because here in Hong Kong, they can access both mainland and international data. Sun said the next step is to formulate a specific plan for the data transfer deal with the mainland cyberspace administration. He emphasized that there is no need for Hong Kongers to worry about the personal data being shared, as the city has strict laws in place regarding data privacy. Having been in office for one year, the innovation chief noted that Hong Kong's innovation policy has already produced results, citing that the city placed first in Asia for emerging startup ecosystems in this year's Global Startup Ecosystem Report. Timothy Lee, TVB News. Financial Secretary Paul Chan said many Shanghai companies have shown interest in expanding their presence on the international stage with Hong Kong as a base. Chan's comment came after he had traveled to Shanghai and attended the World Artificial Intelligence Conference. He said the trip had gone well and that many investors have been attracted to Hong Kong. Chan added all companies understand the advantages of the SAR, such as its importance in international trade. Executive Council convener Regina Ip said authorities are trying to deliver a strong message to foreign countries that the individuals who fled to their shores may have committed serious national security offenses. She was referring to arrest warrants issued by the police against eight fugitives, each with a $1 million bounty. Mimo Sengai reports. The Hong Kong national security law has been in force for three years. Last Monday, police said arrest warrants had been issued for eight activists accused of being in violation of the law. All of them are now based overseas, including the UK and Australia. Speaking on the TPB program, Executive Council convener Regina Eve said Monday's high-profile announcement shows that authorities do not expect foreign governments to hand over the fugitives. Nonetheless, she said it still serves a purpose in delivering a strong message. But this move will send very clear signals to the international community that these are people involved in very serious national security offences. Harboring them really is damaging to Hong Kong and against our laws. And it also sends very clear signals to overseas Chinese communities. These are very dangerous individuals and they should dissociate them, themselves from these uh, fugitives. When asked whether a time frame should be set to implement Article 23 of the Basic Law, it shared the same perspective as Chief Executive John Lee that the SAR should enact the legislation promptly. Macau has done it in 2009. In Hong Kong, this has been long outstanding for 26 years. So, of course, we need to, the government needs to produce the necessary draft legislation 
for the legislature to work on as soon as possible. Article 23 prohibits seven categories of acts that endanger national security, such as treason and theft of state secrets. The former Secretary for Security said some changes must be made to make the law more effective. A lot of the wording and the scope of the offences is highly outdated. So the government needs to work on the, the scope of the offence and the wording to modernise it. It suggests authorities should take cues from other foreign countries in drafting the legislation. Memos and I, TPB News. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen's visit to Beijing drew to a close earlier today. Yellen said the 10 hours of bilateral meetings she had held with senior Chinese officials over the four-day trip were direct and productive. Daniel Rao reports. Over the course of her four-day trip to Beijing, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen met with officials including Premier Li Cheng, Vice Premier He Li Feng and People's Bank of China Deputy Governor Pan Gongsheng. She also met U.S. companies doing business in China, climate finance experts and economists. During the talks, Yellen called for more cooperation on economic and climate issues while criticizing what she called punitive actions against U.S. companies in China. She reiterated that Washington was not seeking to decouple from China's economy, as doing so would be disastrous for both countries and destabilizing for the world. Yellen said she had emphasized to her Chinese counterparts that any investment curbs would be highly targeted and clearly directed narrowly at a few sectors where the U.S. has national security concerns. With regard to Russia's ongoing invasion of Ukraine, she stated it is essential that Chinese firms avoid providing Moscow with material support for the war or innovating sanctions. Before departing China on Sunday, Yellen said the United States and China remained at odds on a number of issues. However, she expressed confidence that her visit had advanced efforts to put the relationship on short footing. Even where we don't see eye to eye, I believe there is clear value in the frank and in-depth discussions we had on the opportunities and challenges in our relationship and the better understanding it gave us of each country's actions and intentions. Broadly speaking, I believe that my bilateral meetings, which totaled about 10 hours over two days, served as a step forward in our effort to put the U.S.-China relationship on a surer footing. During their talks, Chinese officials told Yellen that it is regretful that bilateral relations had experienced difficulties caused by a series of unexpected incidents. They also expressed hopes that Washington would take a rational and practical attitude towards their ties. Yellen's trip comes ahead of a possible meeting between President Xi Jinping and U.S. President Joe Biden at September's Group of 20 summit in New Delhi, or an Asia-Pacific Economic Corporation gathering scheduled for November in San Francisco. Dunwell, TV News. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky marked the 500th day of his country's war with Russia on Saturday with a video from Snake Island in the Black Sea. The island became an icon of Ukraine's resistance after Kyiv's troops retook it from Russian invasion forces four months after the war began early last year. Meanwhile, the U.S. decision to supply Ukraine with cluster bombs has caused concern among many NATO allies. Nazvi Karim has more. Snake Island in the Black Sea, now a Ukrainian symbol of victory in their war with Russia. For it was here on June 30th last year that Russian forces abandoned the island after coming under heavy pounding, with Moscow saying they withdrew as a goodwill gesture. It was also the scene of the most famous expletive of the war when a Ukrainian soldier responded to a Russian commander of the Moskova ship demanding they surrender or die during the first days of the invasion. The Moskva was later sunk by Ukrainian missiles. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky used Snake Island as the backdrop to mark Saturday's 500th day of the war. He released a video showing him visiting the rocky outcrop to pay tribute to the soldiers who were lost, laying flowers at a shrine. It is not known when the video was shot, because on Saturday, Zelensky was returning from Turkey with five commanders who'd gained fame defending the Avastal steel plant in Mariupol in a grueling siege last year that lasted three months. The freed military officers, some belong to the Azov regiment Russia accuses of being Nazis, held out in tunnels and bunkers under the steel plant until they finally surrendered. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov denounced their return to Ukraine 
saying the prisoner exchange agreement in September, brokered by Ankara, required the commanders to remain in Turkey until the war ends. Meanwhile, Ukraine's defense minister Oleksiy Reznikov has welcomed the U.S. decision to send cluster bombs to Kiev, even as many of Washington's NATO allies oppose the move. The bombs are prohibited in more than 100 countries, including the United Kingdom and the United Nations Convention on Cluster Munitions. The U.K., Canada, Spain and Germany are among the nations who have expressed their concern. U.S. President Joe Biden said it was a difficult decision to approve the cluster bombs, which can cause devastating civilian losses if dropped on populated areas. The U.S. and Russia are not signatories to the treaty. Well, the UK is signatory to a convention which prohibits the production or use of cluster munitions and discourages their use. We will continue to do our part to support Ukraine against Russia's illegal and unprovoked invasion. Nazvi Karim, TVB News. President Biden spent some time at a beach with family in his home state of Delaware on Saturday, ahead of his multi-country trip to Europe that includes the NATO summit. Biden leaves on Sunday for Europe, where he'll spend time in three nations tending to alliances that have been tested by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The first stop is London, where Biden will meet King Charles III for the first time since the monarch's coronation. Next step, next is the centerpiece of the trip, the NATO summit in Vilnius, Lithuania. Alliance leaders will debate the Russia-Ukraine war and revise plans for dealing with Russian aggression. The final stop is in Helsinki, where Biden is expected to celebrate the expanding alliance with Finland as the newest member of NATO. The White House says the trip will bolster Biden's standing as a world leader. The UN nuclear watchdog's director general has been trying to reassure South Korea's opposition parties over Japan's plan to release treated radioactive water from the Fukushima nuclear power plant into the sea. Rafael Grossi has been in Seoul since Friday. He was grilled by the skeptical Democratic Party members who are worried the IAEA has not been thorough enough in its investigation. Grossi looked uncomfortable at times during questioning, but told politicians his decision to approve the wastewater release was based on transparent scientific research. The South Korean government backs the agency's report. Protests have been held in South Korea's capital and other Asian cities over the weekend. People are concerned about food safety and the impact on marine life. Still ahead, Dutch Prime Minister Mark Root hands in his resignation to the king after the collapse of his ruling coalition. In Atlanta, in the U.S., a robbery did not go according to plan. And Pope Francis names 21 new cardinals with Hong Kong Bishop Stephen Chow among them. Welcome back. The long-standing Prime Minister of the Netherlands has told the King his government has collapsed after a disagreement over immigration. Mark Rutte will hold talks with his conservative WD party to decide if he will stand in new elections to be held later this year. David Garrett reports. The royal palace in the Netherlands embattled Prime Minister Mark Rutte arriving. Who werd u wakker vanmorgen? Rutte clearly not wanting to answer questions. He politely asked the journalist to move aside so he could drive into the palace grounds to meet with King William Alexander. He would have to explain to the monarch that his government had ceased to function. The coalition he helped to mould has collapsed. He went through the large gates knowing the previous evening's disagreements over his immigration policy meant he no longer had enough backers in Parliament. As Rutte climbed the carpeted steps, he knew he'd be telling the king there will need to be new elections this year. He was inside for over an hour. Details of the conversation remain private. The 56-year-old won the last general election in 2021. In total, he's been in power for 13 years. Rutte is the Netherlands' longest-serving prime minister. 
Like many European leaders, Rutte is grappling with rising immigrant numbers. Asylum seekers are up. There are claims about overcrowded migrant centres. He told Parliament he wants to move to a two-tier system, a temporary one for people fleeing conflicts and a permanent one for those escaping persecution. Rutte also wants to reduce the number of family members who are allowed to join asylum seekers in the Netherlands. That policy was torpedoed by minority coalition partner Christian Union. Now, Ruta can only push through his plan with a mandate from the public. I spoke to him personally once, and I think he's a good uh, Mr. President, but he made uh, a lot of mistakes, that's true. But he never gave up, so that's uh, important for being uh, a president. I think he's pretty much done. Um, I think he's a fairly decent manager, but I think he lacks vision, and I think he's overdue. The morning newspapers speculated on whether Ruta has voter support or even the personal will to fight for a fifth term. This political chapter closes. Ruta now heads a caretaker administration until a general election, probably in November. David Garrett, TVB News. In the U.S. city of Atlanta, a robbery attempt didn't really go to plan when a man stormed into a nail salon and demanded money. But the customers didn't get down. They didn't give him all their money. In fact, they didn't give him any money. They didn't seem in the slightest bit concerned about the weapon. He appeared to be brandishing under a bin liner. The robber took one woman's mobile phone. She left the premises. The other patrons continued to take no notice, and the robber was forced to give up and leave. Police have issued a $2,000 reward for information. Pope Francis announced on Sunday that he has chosen 21 new cardinals, including Hong Kong's Catholic bishop, Stephen Chow. The Pope announced the list during his weekly appearance in front of the public in St. Peter's Square in Vatican City. Among those selected is Hong Kong Bishop Stephen Chow. The ceremony to formally install them as cardinals will be held on September 30th. And digital technology is dominating our lives, but it is not limited to scientific disciplines. It is now also gaining traction in the cultural and academic fields. In Hong Kong, the study of digital humanities is an evolving discipline. Mimo Sengai spoke to two digital humanists who hope to promote the field in the city. Welcome to the famous Royal Opera House at the Palace of Versailles in France. Take a look at the Hall of Mirrors. Before you know it, you are staring at the panoramic view of the Gallery of Battles. But you are not in France, you are in Hong Kong, at the Virtually First Sight exhibition held at the Heritage Museum. To bring an immersive history and cultural experience to visitors, the exhibition includes interactive activities and technologies, including virtual reality. With VR technology, you can immerse yourself in the opulent rooms of the palace. With digital museums becoming a trend around the world, including Hong Kong, a local historian and digital humanist who specializes in the Song Dynasty said technology in humanities opens up new possibilities. These are things that um, you don't often see, even when you visit in person. Um, let's take, for example, the Fazal's exhibition. You know, I have been to the palace, but there are many sort of rooms of digital projections in the exhibition that I haven't seen myself during my trip. Professor Cherry said digital humanities has a long history, starting as long ago as the 1940s. In Hong Kong, nonetheless, Choi believes more promotional work should be done to further develop the field. Mainland China and Taiwan have been developing this field um, and have been putting in a lot of uh, resources. But we seem to be lagging behind a little bit. Meanwhile, digital historian Javier Cha from the University of Hong Kong hopes people are aware of the advantage of using data and technologies in historical research. 
One of the most common qu uh, challenges or simply a, a question uh, posed to me is, so what have you overturned? And they would say, like, you receive so much funding, you do all this work using this powerful technology. What did you overturn? And my answer is, uh, I didn't overturn anything. <laughs> so what this is doing is basically refining. Professor Cha's student, Park jong Wu from South Korea, says studying humanities alongside digital technologies will allow him to approach things from an interdisciplinary perspective. Digital humanities will be have a high potential within the next, you know, like 20 years or, or you know, like 30 years or so. There will be a period of time where the digital humanities have a high potential. Professor Cha anticipates more students will become interested in digital humanities courses in the future. Memos 9, TVB News. That is the news. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.